So let's, uh, let's just bow in a word of prayer before we bring the word here. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel of John. We thank you, Lord, that your servant John, the apostle, uh, was inspired to write the truth of who you are and, and what you plan and what you did, um, God, for, for us. And uh, Lord, we just pray this morning that as we open the word, that you would speak. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would anoint the words that come from my lips and that I would be true to the context that you have desired the folks here today to understand. And we just praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So after Jesus turned the water into wine at Cana, and after he visited Nicodemus the Pharisee and explained the spiritual need for people to be born again, and uh, we see Jesus takes his disciples into the Judean uh, wilderness to spend some time with them. But evidently, uh, as they went, uh, other people who had been hearing Jesus teach followed them. So today our text continues in the book of John chapter 3. Our text this morning is verses 22 to 36. Today I'm going to be talking to you about repentance, baptism, and salvation, which is the subject material in the text this morning. So this morning, uh, starting with verse 22, we read, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anion near Salem, because there was plenty of water, and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. So for uh, we, we dive into the context of what's taking place here. And for a short time, the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of John the Baptist overlapped. And during this time, it's evident that both Jesus and John were teaching people similar things about repentance and the coming of the kingdom of God. And a certain Jewish leader was arguing with John's disciples about the propriety of the baptisms that were being done in regards to ceremonial washing and the traditions of the, of the people. There were uh, ceremonial washings that occurred during this time when, when, with, the, with the oral traditions passed down uh, through the scribes and the Pharisees. They did some of this. So there, was, there seemed to be some uh, disagreement or discussion as to what the place of ceremonial washing was. But that's not the subject of our material here. Um, that was just a Jewish uh, probably a Pharisee or a teacher of the law or something, having a discussion with John the Baptist's disciples. Um, some scholars speculate that maybe this was Nicodemus even, the, the one that we had talked about just prior to, to this section of Scripture, who had come to Jesus by night, and Jesus told them, you must be born again before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. But there's no, there's no firm... Uh, there's no firm indication that it was, in fact, him. It was just somebody. But it was evident. It was evident that the reason why people were coming to be baptized, both by John and, and by Jesus and his disciples, was that um, many people, um, God was doing a work inside of people in preparation for what he was about to accomplish. And you know something? We sometimes think we're... Uh, you know, like we face a day and just everything just sort of unfolds by chance almost. And sometimes we treat it like that. 
And, and, and the natural world, that's what people think. They think it just happens to be the day. It's the luck of the draw. Whatever happens that day happens. But you know something? The Bible tells us that the Lord God is in control of all things. And you know, when God wants to do something um, in, in, in a scenario, he always prepares people for what he is about to do. Today, it's the same thing. When God's preparing to do something great amongst the people, he always prepares the ground ahead of it. So I, I, uh, I believe that the foundation for what was to come is being laid with the baptisms that were taking place with John the Baptist and with Jesus Christ and his disciples. So Jesus had his disciples baptized, and we, if you look at the first verse in chapter 4, we'll be dealing with more of that next week, but that's, it says that Jesus' disciples were actually doing the baptizing. But what God was doing is he was putting a hunger inside the people's hearts for the truth. People were tired of, I guess, the, the feeling of, of oppression in their lives. And they wanted God to intervene. They were getting hungry to see something happen. As a matter of fact, when they came to to hear John the Baptist and they came to hear Jesus preaching, what they heard, and this is the foundation level of all teachings of Christian teaching, what they heard was that, that Jesus and John were calling people to repentance He was calling to more repentance. You see, God has to break us before we're going to turn to him and let him deal with the things that need to be dealt with in our heart. He has got to break us. So God will prepare the ground and set the stage for us to be broken before he comes in healing, before he comes in salvation. See, John testified in verse 26, as soon as, as, soon as this whole uh, thing was brought up to him, he testified to the people that Jesus was the Messiah, and when, and, and when people began to follow Jesus more than they followed him, I mean, John's disciples reported it as an observation, and they're kind of wondering what the take of John was going to be on this, but, but, but John made it very clear that that Jesus was the reason that he even had his ministry. Jesus, the Messiah, was the reason why he even produced a message calling people to repentance ahead of the coming Messiah. It was him. It was Jesus that was the focal point. The interesting thing is that both John the Baptist, who the Bible says carried the spirit of Elijah, and Jesus, their thrust, the thrust of their message was repent for the time is coming for the Savior to enter the scene and to, and, to, and to do his work. The Messiah is coming. It very clearly tells us that before salvation can occur, there must be a willingness within us to turn toward God and to turn away from our life of sin. And you might ask, well, how can I do that? My friend, you can't do that. That is something that God does in you. But God prepares your heart. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, God is preparing your heart to hear the message of the gospel. What you do with it after that is, is, is a choice that you have to make. But God prepares the ground. Nobody comes to know Jesus Christ as Savior unless the Holy Spirit draws them first. When it comes to the kingdom of God, living the Christian life, it's been said that there is freedom in submission to the authority of God's word over us and bondage when we rebel against it. In other words, for us to experience freedom from the ravages and the penalty of sin, 
we must come to the point where we're willing to admit that we don't know what's best. But we must come under the submission of God, to God. And we, got, we have to allow, open our spirits to allow Him to put His finger on the things that He wants to change in us. And we have to be willing to step aside and put our way of thinking on the shelf and open our hearts to God's way of thinking and let Him speak into us to tell us how we ought to live and behave and what things we ought to do and other things that we ought to avoid doing. Consider Adam and Eve for a moment. Naturally speaking, Eve liked to have the controls. She liked to be in control. We like to be in control too, don't we? (laughs) We don't like to have someone else have the controls. Eve was tempted by Satan and was deceived to pursue power and wisdom on her own terms apart from God's authority. She was deceived into thinking that her reason and approach to gaining wisdom for her life was correct. So rather than heeding God, she pursued her own understanding. And we understand what happened next, right? She questions God's authority over her. And she embraces her own authority over her. And she falls into sin. Adam, on the other hand, he wasn't deceived. He wasn't beguiled by the serpent. He knew firsthand what God had said concerning eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He was told that death would come if he disobeyed. This was given to him prior to Eve being being created. God was given a directive by or God gave a directive to Adam, rather, not to eat from that tree, because if he did, he would surely die. So he's still knowing fully what God had said, decided that he was going to do it his own way, with full knowledge of the consequences. And friends, this is why Adam was held responsible for and accountable for bringing sin into the world. The first, the first man was the gateway for sin to come into the world. See, he did his own thing, his own way, out of blatant rebellion. Eve was deceived into doing it. Adam just did it because of pure, selfish rebellion. Sometimes, like Adam and Eve, we desire to approach the kingdom of God as if it were a democracy, when in fact the kingdom of God is not a democracy. It is a kingdom, and a king rules it. Within the kingdom, based upon the will of the king, there is a designated order and authority as to how that kingdom is to operate. And what I mean to say is that it's hard to understand kingdom principles with a democratic mindset. You see, democracy is fine, and and thank the Lord that we have one, because having a sinful man being an authoritarian dictator over us is terrible, (laughs) because all the sin is, is pounded on you, right? And you are forced to do terrible things, Democracy, still terrible things happen, but we have choices, right? We have choices. But the structure of the kingdom of God is not democratic because God is king and God is good. You see, we don't have to worry about God being um, like an evil dictator. He's not. There's no darkness in him. There's no shadow of turning with him. He is a good, good father. There is, there is perfect decisions that are made And in a world where we see imperfect decisions being made, sometimes people don't want to trust God. But, you see, God is trustworthy. He's trustworthy. And he calls us to place our trust in what he tells us in his word. 
So we must come to that place where we're willing to turn our way towards him and to abandon our life of sinful thinking and put it aside. And God draws us, and he gives us the strength to do this. But the kingdom of God is not subject to popular opinion, voting, or polls. God's word cannot be elective that we either choose to follow or we don't. I was talking to someone today or the other day about fence, fences and how really there is no fence. You're either with God or you're against them. Sometimes we get this thought that we can partition our lives and we can give this part of our lives to God and we'll hold on to this for ourselves. That's simply not the case. This is why John the Baptist and Jesus Christ were preaching about repentance ahead of salvation. Because the two are, they need to be together. We must come to a place where we acknowledge that we are sinners and that we need a Savior and that we can't do it ourselves. And we need to come to the place where we're willing to give Him the Lordship over us. That's why it's foundational. Now, when they were baptizing people, it was a baptism of repentance that they were given. People were saying, I want you, God, to change me. I want you to save me. I want the Messiah to save me. That's what they were doing. And this was essential for what was to come. See, because of our natures, we find it difficult to obey God. See, in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our natures, we're conditioned to self-rule. And unknowingly, we develop a contempt for authority. And, and, and this contempt for authority within us leads us to lose the fear of the Lord. Now, Proverbs 9 verse 10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When we fear the Lord, we show a reverence and obedience to Him that He deserves as our Creator and as our ultimate judge. It's not a slavish fear where we, we, where we think of Him as a tyrant. That's not that kind of fear because He's not a tyrant. God is the embodiment of love and everything that that means. We don't understand in ourselves. The, no, the fear of the Lord is, is coming from a functional place where as a son or daughter, we recognize the goodness of God and His love for us. And, and we have this awe about Him. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth could care to know my name, could care to know my worth? This is awe of God and, and a trust of God that God, I trust you because you're my creator and you know what's best for my life. And I love you, God. I want to serve you. You see, you can't force yourself to be holy because it's not in you to do that. The only way that you're ever going to live in a way that pleases God is if you fall deeply in love with him. So in the church, when the love of many wax cold, in a society where love is cold, where love is self-seeking, there is brokenness. God wants his church to be a place where true love flourishes. Where true love for God is at the core of everything we do. And when the true love of God is at the core of everything we do, you just watch how God changes your heart. He changes your appetites. He makes you a new creation. This is why God calls to repentance and says, people, See that you can't do it on your own. You can't make it on your own. It's only through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all that you can even take one step. 
in the Spirit. It is only submission to Him. When we fear the Lord, we show Him the reverence and obedience He deserves as our Creator and our ultimate judge. One day, each one of us will stand before Him. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the blood of Jesus that covers over all of my sin and washes me clean because it's not me who saves myself. It's the covering of Christ and the robe of righteousness that is placed across my shoulders because of the grace of God. And it is only found through faith. I can't earn it. But when I submit to it and I understand the power of it, my heart is filled with such a gratitude and a reverence for God that I desire to be obedient to Him and I give Him everything that I am and everything that I have. It belongs to Him. My life is not my own. It was purchased with a price. The precious blood of Jesus has purchased me. So now when Christ has purchased me, when the Father looks upon me, He no longer sees me. He sees the work of Christ. He sees a saint rather than a sinner. Oh, my friends, this grace awakening needs to take place because if we don't get it, if we try it, if we try to do it on our own, we're not going to make it. All we're going to be is bitter old legalistic people that try and force things on our own. And that's not going to work. That's not the savor of the Spirit of God. The savor of the Spirit of God is the breath of life, and it is love. But Jesus wants us to walk in this path. It's not just people that don't know Christ who need to repent sometimes. Out of the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, it's repetitively repeated, repent, repent, repent. See the place where you have fallen and repent. Why? Because we're weak and we can't do it alone and we try to do it alone and we need to come back to the throne of God all the time and say, Lord, change me. I repent. I leave it behind. This is why preceding salvation, we don't enter a religious ceremony to become a Christian. It's not like you have a checklist of do's and don'ts. See, those, those kind of checklists bind us into a form of godliness, but with no power. A form of godliness, but no power. God wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is dunamis. In Greek, the power of God, the life-changing, life-giving power of God, God wants to fill you with the Spirit so that you're overflowing with his love, so that when you walk out into the community, when you walk into the meetings in your church and you begin to share with other people, God takes you the little that you have to offer and he multiplies it and he blesses and he gives life. The only way that we're going to reach this generation for Christ is if they see the love of God in us. The only way that I, we're going to have a, a church that is functioning the way God wants us to function is if the love of Christ is at the helm of every decision we make. It's not about me, Jesus. It's about you. This is why at the start of the Christian church when Peter preached his powerful sermon, you remember in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, when, when, when Peter was baptized in the Holy Spirit, he spoke to 3,000 Jews who gave their hearts, their spirits. They turned their spirit over to Christ. They were cut to the heart. Why? Because the spirit was speaking through Peter. And this is what Peter said to them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
See, repentance precedes infilling. And that's what they needed. That's what they needed. And that's what they received. And that was the launching point. And we're the benefactors of all of that. But the same principle holds true today. Before God can move in power in a church, there must be repentance and a bowing of the knee of the heart to the sovereign rule of God over us. John the Baptist was not threatened by Jesus rising to take his place on the world stage. He assures his disciples that people turning to Jesus were turning to him because he was the promised Messiah that he was trying to tell them about. He was the reason why he was baptizing. He was the one. All eyes were on him. In verse 28 of our text, John the Baptist's testimony is this. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. And this is the first reference in the Bible of the word picture showing the people of God as the bride of Christ. The reference is made by John the Baptist. And the Baptist continues his illustration referring to himself as the best man of the Savior ahead of the, the wedding. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits, says John, and listens for him, and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. Every prophetic voice that ever was issued into history, and every voice of the heart of a, of a saint of God, every voice must say, I must decrease and you must increase. Lord, may you increase and may I decrease that when they look at me, they see you in me. They don't see the person that I am when I am weak, but they see you in me as the spirit of Christ fills me and works in and through me. This is the only way and it's not something we can work up. It is a way in which we submit, we must come under submission to God and come to the end of ourselves. That's only possible when this happens. And John the Baptist says this, he says, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. In other words, John tells his disciples that he is the one from the earth who belongs to the earth, but Jesus is the one who has come from earth to earth from heaven. He is above all. Again, he repeats this, so his disciples are crystal clear in what he is saying. The reason why we acknowledge Jesus Christ is because there is power in the name of Jesus because Jesus is God's Savior, and he is the one that we must enter the gates through. Because he is the gate. The one who comes from heaven is above all. Holy fear, reverence for God. Jesus, have your way in me even when I can't do it myself. I need you. In verse 32, John prophesies that Jesus will testify what he has seen and heard from God the Father. But he tells his disciples that the majority of the people will reject his testimony because he does not fit what they think the Messiah should look like. But this fulfills the ancient prophecy of Isaiah. More than 700 years before the birth of Christ in Isaiah 53, which reads in verse 1 starting, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one whom, from whom people hide their faces. Are you hearing this? He was despised and we held him in low esteem. See, Jesus came in humble circumstances. He 
could have come in a much different way, but he chose to come in humble circumstances. But despite this fact, God would do something miraculous through Jesus because God will reserve a number of people who accept his message. And John the Baptist continues in verse 33 exclaiming, whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God gives the spirit without limit. You see, the Jewish leadership of the day, they rejected Jesus as their Messiah, and they brought him before the Roman authorities to ask that the Romans could get rid of him, to ask the Romans to execute him, because he didn't fit their mold. And just before Jesus was crucified, he stood on trial before the governor, Roman, Roman governor Pontius Pilate, and he shared his purpose with the governor. Pilate was inquiring about Jesus because he heard that Jesus was, some people were saying that Jesus was the king of the Jews. And he needed to figure out what was going on to see if Jesus was a threat to the Roman Empire or not. So it was recorded in John 3, or John 18, 33 to 38, I should say. We really read that it was Pilate's understanding that Jesus was a king. So he says this, he says, Pilate then went back inside his palace, the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Well, am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate, said Pilate. And Jesus answered, you say I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate cynically says, what is truth? Retorted Pilate. And with this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there and said, I find no basis for charges against him. So despite the rejection of Jesus by the leadership of the people, Jesus tells Pilate the fact that that his interests were not to set up a political dynasty. His interests were spiritual. He was, he was a king, but his kingdom was not flesh and blood, not of this world. His purpose to coming was to testify to spiritual truth that would that would establish a kingdom by setting people free from their sins and bringing them to at oneness with their heavenly creator where they had been fractured because of their disobedience. He said Jesus should be let go because he wasn't a political threat, obviously. And we know what happened next. The Jewish religious leaders of the day wouldn't take no for an answer. There was a near riot asking for Jesus to be executed. So finally, Pilate, during the Passover time, decided that it was better for one man to die than for the riot to sweep over his realm and cause trouble. So, he decreed that Jesus should be handed over to be crucified. But you see, folks, this was the plan of God from the very beginning. 
See, before the foundations of the earth were laid, God understood what he desired and what price he was going to have to pay to accomplish that. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, the Son of God didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is a spiritual king that has come to set those who are enslaved by their passions and their sins, enslaved by something that will lead them to eternal death, and to set them free and to give them in place of death life. And not just life, but life abundantly. See, the Lord is calling us as his people to embrace the life that he's given to us. And despite the brokenness of the world around us, in the midst of the storms, we can smile at the storms, not because the storms are easy or pleasant, but because we know that God has reign over all things and he will take everything, and that means everything, and work it together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So today, if you're suffering, if you're broken, if you're beaten down, come to Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life for you to, ex to experience eternal life, starting here and starting now. Jesus, although he was creator of the universe, decided to willingly allow the, the people he created to put him through physical torture and death. Why? Because of love. And this is why John the Baptist said this in verse 35 of our text. The father loves the son and has placed everything, not just some things, has placed everything in his hands. God the Father has established that God the Son should willingly give his life. Philippians 2, 6 to 11 says, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And this is the message that was proclaimed by the apostles of our Lord Jesus when the first church started over 2,000 years ago. And it is still what I and many pastors all over the world are still preaching today, on this very day. In the words of Peter to the Jewish crowd, listening to what he had to say on the day of Pentecost, I'm speaking the same word to you today. To the Jews, Peter proclaimed, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And to all of you today, I proclaim in words of truth from the mouth of Peter in Acts 4.12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name, other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And John the Baptist told his disciples the verdict and the final word. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The question today in closing is, why? Why as a human race are we so stubborn? in resisting the Holy Spirit. Why are we so stubborn when God gives us everything that we need for life and godliness and salvation through Christ to try and make it happen on our own, to try and 
fill our lives and fulfill our lives in our own. Christ has given us everything. He's given us indwelling Holy, the indwelling Holy Spirit who will be with us forever. Today, if you're here and you're struggling and you're saying, I, I, I don't, Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't know what to do. My friend, what you need to do is come with a heart of repentance before God and cast yourself before him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't do it on my own. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Have mercy on me, son of David. For you are the Messiah, and you are God, and there is none besides you. And I can't do this on my own. I can't walk the life of faith on my own. I can't even give my life to you on my own. I need you, Jesus. Every hour I need you. I cannot save myself through clever suggestions and clever plans made by man. I need you, Lord. I need you. Take the shackles off of me. Lord, free my heart from useless things that bind me. You are a God who saves, delivers, and heals Oh, people, we can't save ourselves by our own power. We can't save ourselves when shackles of, of sin bind us. It's not in us to do this. That's why we need a Savior. Repent today. Turn away from the fruitless deeds of darkness and submit your spirit to the cleansing of the Savior and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you will experience life and peace. And if your love has waxed cold, my friend, Today is the day when you can come before him and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm so broken and I'm so, I've let my mind go off on a trail that wasn't right. Forgive me, Lord. Restore. Fill me. Help me. And he who comes to the Lord will not be turned away. If you ask the Lord when you're hungry for a fish, he doesn't give you a snake. When you ask him for bread, he doesn't give you a rock. He knows what you need before you even pray, but he wants you to come and humble yourself before him in repentance. Say, Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. There's so much wisdom in that old hymn. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite with what I withhold. Take my life, Lord. We live in this world soaked in sin and evil and immoral behavior and hatred and anger and addiction. Oh, Jesus, help me to see that you are higher than I. Oh, Lord, fill me with your love. Renew my first love, Lord. And you do that, my friend, and God will lead the way. Amen.